Good morning. I didn't get a video together last week because I spent I spent almost the whole week at home uh, with sick kids. You know, life, life didn't happen. Uh, but this week I'm shooting like three videos. Today I am so excited because I got onto the schedule of Julianne Dow Canton. She is the chair of our department, a world-renowned scientist and expert in galaxies and stellar populations and uh, and a very long list of other things. And also an incredibly deep thinker about the profession and the and the art of being a scientist and communicating science and an avid dog owner. And so without further ado, here's my coffee time chat with Professor Julianne Dalcan. I refuse to be defined by my own self-applied labels, so I'm drinking tea for a coffee time. You know, in on in on <laughs> I was gonna say in honor of you drinking tea, yeah. but also just because I've had three cups of coffee today already, and so... That doesn't sound like enough. I, it, <laughs> it, it won't be enough. No, it's the day is not over. I got some interesting questions from people, like, what's it like being the greatest of all time? I want to ask, I want to talk about, um, how do you make good ideas? Which I think is related to writing. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know... And it's something that's like, it's hard to... I've been having this like meta conversation with myself and I gradually like I, I asked everybody mm. this about like how do we train people explicitly in research yeah. so like I started a writing class because that was something where I felt like we expected a certain level of performance and where I saw really amazing people's careers have having struggles was when they weren't able to take their fantastic ideas mm. and actually submit them for publication mm -hmm. right that, that that that's kind of the currency by which the field goes and also if you have an idea and it's just in your mind and on your laptop other people don't get to mm -hmm. interact with it and query it and be inspired by it so you know I started a writing class to try to teach that mm -hmm. intentionally but I've been trying to think a lot about like how do we train people in research intentionally mm -hmm. like as a you know you get when you're experienced enough at it and you've and you've got the survivor bias that you've actually made it in. <laughs> you know, we have periods where it's like, oh yeah, my research is going really well. Oh, I'm not being very effective in my research. Right. You're collaborating with a student who's just, you know, getting their feet wet. And it's like, oh, how's the student doing? They're doing really well. Oh, they're having a hard time. And often it's very difficult about how do you say what makes that differentiation mm. between when things are going well and when things are stalled and what are can can we explicitly train some of this stuff because i'm very much about you know there's so much potential in the field that i feel like we lose a lot of people's genius because we're not intentionally training them in some of the stuff that they know and that winds up being something where um, that just really compounds a lot of questions of about mm -hmm. like what kind of capital people have when they move in, that if you are the child of academics, you just sort of know how the system works, you know what you can ask for, and so I'm very interested in, like, how do you make the implicit, explicit, explicit, mm -hmm. and thus learnable and trainable, and help people be better. Because that's something where I always felt like part of the UW program was always really good about, you know, admitting people from a wide range of backgrounds that had the potential and then trying to be very mindful about mm. helping them reach that potential as opposed to let's just admit people who are already superstars and just not try to break them too much and <laughs> hope they get out the other end. Is the only way to do it have a bunch of crappy ideas first? Yeah, that's, that's certainly, that's certainly, so there's a bunch of stuff. So, I mean, one is reading really broadly and attending talks mm. really broadly and you know, allowing yourself the freedom to just be interested in a lot of stuff. And I, and I do worry that with some of the difficulties in the field in terms of just people feeling very, very stressed out all the time for rational, it's a rational response sometimes to the incentives <laughs> that are better that, that go on in the field, yeah. but it cuts out people's feeling of joy and exploration, which is actually something that can really fuel the kind of science that mm -hmm. then does make your career easier, mm -hmm. right? So there, there are projects that you do where it's a pretty clear track, right? I've got, you know, I've got a really great data set, I'm going to do a thing, I'm going to measure a thing, and I'm going to get the paper out. And so when you're in those periods, it's very tempted to just kind of march forward very 
and and there's great science that comes out of that, right? And there's certain like ambitious projects that don't happen without a whole lot of people doing mm -hmm. that. Um, but you do also need times when either as an individual or as a field to allow some fraction of individuals to act that way where you know you're trying to forge connections between so you're going down one path but you see a talk about something else and you realize it intersects with the other thing and then you go exploring mm -hmm. that aspect of it mm -hmm. so i think there's a there's a little bit of a tension that the more pressure people feel under the less freedom that they feel to actually explore, and sometimes in that exploration is where a lot of those innovative ideas comes in, especially in astronomy where you know, everything you look at in space depends on practically every other thing mm -hmm. that's out there. Mm -hmm. And so um, the more you know about stuff, the better you can p put those pieces together. Like I, uh, there was an old canard, and I don't know who it dates back to, that like a lot of, um, you know, a lot of astronomers tend to do some of their most important work like in their 40s. Hmm. It's not like math or something where, you know, you're just a kid genius and you, yeah, yeah. You <laughs> Still got a little time left. <laughs> no, you got a lot of time left. Four Ds, which goes up, yeah, you know, runs yeah, up, right. to, run, runs oh, up into 50. Uh, <laughs> and because, because it's so many different interacting systems that the yeah. more you know about all those different pieces, you really start to see those connections and find interesting niches where other people aren't currently occupying it mm -hmm. or taking the tools from one area and applying them to some other some other area. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is definitely being just absolutely brutal on your idea the ideas mm -hmm. that you have in terms of just assessing whether or not they're actually any good. It's easy to fall in love with your stuff. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And just because something's exciting to you doesn't necessarily mean it's going to pan out. And, it, and this is what I like about proposal writing, mm. is putting stuff through that rigorous stress testing about is this exactly the right thing at the right time? Is this actually going to be fruitful? Because I think that um, for there are some kinds of projects where you're very much like resource limited. Like if you don't have the biggest glass, it's just not going to happen. Mm. But I would say that in most people's just intellectual life, you're more limited by the amount of time you have to do stuff, mm. right? Like you have ideas, but nobody gives you the time to actually follow it up. And so if that's your limiting resource, you have to choose your path really wi wisely. And so being kind of hard on your ideas and trying to do some credible assessment about whether or not this is actually going to be a useful, fruitful direction mm. early will save you a lot of your time, because the time really is, I think, for a lot of us, like our most, especially as you go on, is, is like your most limiting thing. And so sometimes like there, that comes from um, talking to people. It's also very common for people when, especially when you are thinking broadly, when you look at a field that you're not familiar with, everything seems mm. new and you assume nobody's yeah. Right. We have a little bit of ego. We take to it. It's mm -hmm. like, well, has everybody, anybody ever thought <laughs> about where bulges come from? Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting question. And it's like, yeah, it's an interesting question. And there've been like infinite conference proceedings and you know, conferences on it mm -hmm. and papers written. And so like you sort of have to dive in. So sometimes just talking to people is really good and sort of trying to figure out mm -hmm. those niches. Um, sometimes fast prototyping right? like you push yeah. something all the way through and this is really good for proposals mm -hmm. when you do like the, the quick and dirty thing just to show that the scale of the answer is something that's actually mm -hmm. interesting because sometimes if you make a measurement and you can only make it to 35% that's actually revolutionary because that's enough to really clearly distinguish between models whereas if it's you know is the difference between these models something that needs a 5% precision measurement? Mm -hmm. Are the systematics good enough? And sometimes if you work something through, you can kind of really see, like, uh, it's not really, in the end, going to be exciting to write about. Do you think it's more important for a young person to try to publish the most impactful thing, whatever that means, yeah. or the thing they find the most fun? That's a really good question. It's like an impossible false dichotomy. I think, yeah, but. <laughs> right. It's hard, right? Because sometimes the fun thing leads to the, you know, generally mm. you don't write up your most high impact work just, I'm just going to sit here and ponder, mm -hmm. I'm going to come up with an idea and then do that. There are some people who do work that way, um, but especially in experiment, it's like not the, it's not the easiest way. Mm. And so often 
there's a sequence to stuff. And so sometimes that fun thing is enough that you acquire the insight, you get a better knowledge of the field, you develop some new tools, and mm -hmm. then that takes you somewhere. If you just do fun, fun, fun little, you know, two-page research notes over and over again, that's maybe not building towards a larger expertise about something. What are young people doing wrong these days? Like, you are, already, you are, not, you are already, chair of the department. They already feel so bad all the time. <laughs> <laughs> don't wanna, you're uh, doing great, sweetie. <laughs> it's true. Are there, are there trends that you worry about at this point? Um, with I, I worry, a level of seniority now to I, look back on? I, I worry about early over-specialization. Mm in that the field changes all the time. And so I've had this experience of having taught a graduate extragalactic class every two years for pushing 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I have to overhaul large sections of it every second time that I teach it, which mm -hmm. is a four-year cycle. Okay. So what happens is something... So I go to, I go to teach it and there will be something new that people are talking about. And so I need to make sure that, that that goes in there. Then two years later, there's usually, the, the question's crystallized. Like mm. it's come down to, okay, people have really figured out how to talk about this and now people are really trying to decide if it's this or that. Mm. And then the time after that that I teach it, so it's four years from the beginning, mm -hmm. It's a one, it's like a bullet point about how something <laughs> behaves. Right. Right? There was all of this work and all of these people madly publishing and fighting with each other, sometimes. Um, <laughs> you know, trying to find, oh no, it's this way, it's that way, blah, blah, blah. And then it just becomes, this is like that. I think because of that, if you only know about that thing or you think that, so like that thing you're spending all of your time thinking about right now. Within five years, that is generally not the most interesting question anymore. I like your summary that, you know, within five or six years, the thing that is like keeping up at night has become, like nobody even references what the measurement is anymore. Oh it's yeah, just commonly known. No, 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 no. I have but, I have things where it was like, yeah, that was a really big discovery and nobody knew that, and now it's just like, oh yeah, that's just how it is. That's like conspicuously close to like your mean PhD time as well in most institutions, like from from the time that you walk in the door, you're supposed to start this apprenticeship or this training program to become an expert, is about the same time scale that people will no longer care about the thing that we tell you on day one is like the oh, hot thing. Except though that there is a lot of like lead time. Well, and, and, and so, so it's point, not it's, it's the mentoring that goes into making sure that you're in the right process there, that you, right. you can't grab that bolt of lightning the day you walk in here. You, the, the, right, that, you have to build the skills, right? That's I mean, right. that's the thing. It's like you have to build enough skills that you can you can participate fully in that global discussion about what the universe is actually like. And that mm -hmm. does take time and it takes training. Um, I think where it maybe starts, to, where the time scales do start to become mismatched is during the postdoctoral periods mm. where you're supposed to be showing more, ev more independence, more sense of... I'm somebody who can really shape an intellectual direction. Mm. How do we evaluate good mentorship? How do we evaluate if we're taking care of people well? Because that's something that I'm worrying a lot about and thinking a lot yeah. about these days. Yeah, no, and I've been thinking a lot about it as well. For, you know, some very, very large percentage of junior scientists, a lot of the mentoring can happen informally and, you know, people just naturally accrete more senior people that they can turn to for advice and they start working on a project and you know kind of just letting stuff roll isn't isn't the worst and and completely fine but i think the issues are what happens to the other 30 percent hmm. where a little bit more intentionality would make everybody more successful at reaching their goals whatever those goals are and even in that 70 percent Maybe there's more that they could reach, or maybe they could be better prepared for whatever the next step is mm -hmm. with, again, a little bit more intentionality. And so, so yeah, so I mean, I've definitely been working really hard um, since I took over as chair about trying to identify where those holes are, because I think one thing that's happened within the department is the department's grown a lot, mm -hmm. and that makes, you know, stuff grows, the gaps start to become apparent. So, like, another big thing that I'm really, ch I'm conscious of just, like, personally as a mentor is 
helping younger younger scientists figure out their own story about themselves. Like we all have really bad voices in our head that tell us a lot of just wrong things about ourselves. And we often have difficulties in our life when we try to make our path not fit who we are. Like we, mm. uh, so s something I feel like my job as a mentor is to try to help mirror to people what their actual strengths are. And then to also recognize that I've always, you know, another thing I've always been very keen on is the fact that usually people's greatest strength is their greatest weakness. Yeah, you're a really creative person. Like, you're, you know, you're so great at coming up with ideas. That's fantastic, right? That's a really terrific, that's a really terrific skill to have. One of the difficulties associated with having a lot of really good ideas <laughs> is actually finishing them so that you can move on to the next one or letting something to develop to mm -hmm. kind of like the next level of mastery on that idea. So helping people figure out, so somebody who's super, super creative about a lot of things, that's not somebody who should go down a route where that's not allowed to be seen as a good thing. Mm -hmm. And likewise, somebody who's super detailed oriented, like that's an incredibly valuable trait mm -hmm. on certain projects, but that's maybe not a great match for somebody who, you know, put them in a position where they have to work completely alone and don't have some structure around them that could really help them. you know so yeah. all of these things yeah. are uh, every trait is adaptive in the right environment and helping students figure out how they like to work how they like to think what they're good at and how they can make choices that are aligned with those things or also helping them figure out what are areas where a little more training or more intentionality would get them to their their goals. Mm -hmm. Like maybe you know a lot of this stuff is trainable. Okay, so on Twitter when I when I said that we were going to do coffee time, um, you represented tea. Yeah. Because what, what do you, so I have to ask what are you, what are you drinking? I'm drinking very generic green tea that I found in my desk. <laughs> <laughs> I am drinking Irish breakfast. I like my tea to be as close to espresso as you can possibly get. Can you give me like top three tea places that you found? Okay, I can, how, about I, how about I give you the list of the things that piss me off? That's even better. About tea. <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> okay, number one, this is very, this is really big on my list. These places you go where every single tea that they offer is some unholy mixture of weird crap. And this would be like if you go to a tea store and you happen to want a cup of coffee because you came along with me on an outing. And they said, oh, here is our coffee selection. We have vanilla hazelnut. We have, no, that's, okay, <laughs> it's a menu filled with tea and every one is the equivalent of vanilla hazelnut. Uh. Right, you should always have at least a couple of the basics mm -hmm. before you add on the, okay, so that's number one. Okay. Number two, milk versus cream. Yeah. I mean, which which is it? <laughs> Milk. Okay. I mean, <laughs> and so you know, you go and you say like, I'd like a tea with milk. Is cream okay? It's like with milk. Milk. <laughs> Conferences and whatnot. If you have an urn that has hot water in it for tea, and it's an urn that's previously held coffee, yeah. it's. Oh, I mean, it's really like you're licking the inside of an old coffee pot and trying. Oh, it's oh, it's terrible. I mean, it's bad coffee too. To be fair, it's worse tea. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I don't drink the coffee, but I can guarantee you that the that the, the, the tea flavor is really. Oh, and then there are these places where the fussy coffee places sometimes will get fussy about tea, and will not let you control how long your tea brews uh, like they'll yeah, right. brew it back there and then right. bring it out to you and it's like uh, no tea drinker right like i mean right. some people like it a little and we have we're used to that measure of control and right. we're not offered that is anybody in, in town doing it well is there is there a recommendation so cafe vita on fremont app so it's not all cafe vita <laughs> so it's the cafe vita on fremont app we didn't really get the dogs we didn't get the dogs uh, I are, do are you now pitbull for life I, I have a, I'm kind of two-timing my pitbulls. I have a, I have a crush on a very, very weird Instagram chihuahua mix. 
<laughs> and and I, I can kind of see the appeal of maybe going to the like small, completely absurd. Dot. No, I know, I know. Okay. Right, it's all about the temperament, right? <laughs> so says the owner of the absurd pit bulls. <laughs> yeah, well, see, that's the thing. Is like maybe this is continuing my intellectual journey. As I started with like a reasonably sound, pretty normalish pit bull, and then fostered. I mean, God bless her. She's put together wrong. Uh, she's <laughs> <laughs> insert picture from Julian's Instagram feed of. The, thank okay. You. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks.